Good morning, everyone. First off, I'd like to thank you for coming to share your time with me and the study of God's Word. We've been studying... I thought that was going to be the loud shrill. We've been studying the book of Revelation. And this morning we're on chapters 8 through 11. That's four chapters. Yeah, that's right. So we have some ground to cover. Uh, Todd's going to adjust the volume. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Again, Chris Wright, welcome to Woodland Oaks Church of Christ. For those who are here and live streaming, we're glad that you've made this investment in time. We hope it will be beneficial for your spiritual growth and encouragement. A special welcome to those who... Um, are returning from Mount Yale, the 14,000 plus summit that the um, youth trek came back from successfully. I don't think they left anybody behind. That's the good news. So, As you're reviewing uh, some of the categories that I was able to come up with about the enemies of the Lamb, which is the theme of the study we're doing, uh, I want to just review last week we discussed about the 144,000 sealed of Israel, um, as well as uh, this, this idea of being sealed is, is binary. Either you're a one or a zero. Okay? And the, the other thing was that everybody's sealed with, with a mark. Okay? Either you've got the seal of the Holy Spirit and God's guarantee of your future inheritance, or you have the mark of the beast. So there is no neutral, which is what Jesus said. Either you are for me or you are against me. Uh, we also covered the, the, the tribulation, uh, lowercase t. Uh, yes, they had a tribulation in, in the time of the writing that John wrote this letter from Patmos to the, to the saints in Asia Minor. Uh, they certainly did have a tribulation, but so do you. So do you. Nobody gets through life without trials and persecutions if they're following in Jesus' steps. I wanted to just remind you that the book of Revelation is, is uh, we have to bear in mind the historical context of it. It was written to those folks back in 95 AD, and it certainly did apply to them, but it has application for us as well. It's also written in an um, apocryphal language, which is sometimes difficult to understand. It's a little abstract, uh, and it's written that way as a code, in part, to hide it from the evil Roman Empire because Christians were being rounded up and executed, put to death for their belief in Christ. Certainly they were persecuted by the, the synagogue. Uh, Jesus called the synagogue back in Revelation chapter 3 a synagogue of Satan. They were controlling admittance, membership into the synagogue by whether or not the people had accepted Jesus as the Christ. If they were, they were put out of the synagogue disfellowshipped. And Jesus explained that, no, he was the open door. Um, so we covered that last week. Uh, the narrative is not strictly in chronological order as you read through Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter, and so forth, uh, particularly as you get past the letters to the churches, uh, picking up in about chapter 4. It's, uh, it's actually describing uh, many events in retrospect due to the fact of um, John is recording the vision he sees in a rather, it's, it's a rather circus-like vision in that you see a number of different things going on simultaneously or in parallel, but when you write about them, you can only write one at a time. Okay? So some you write about and then others you, you cover later and it really fits in timeline would be retrospective. So we just have to keep that in mind as we read through the chapters. They're not necessarily in chronological order. Some of the things from 11 really occurred earlier and they're being explained later. So just keep that in mind. It's not a strict this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's important to remember that. Well, OK. 
Okay. All right. Just to give you, uh, you can read. Uh, <clears throat> when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This had not occurred since John began relaying his vision or series of visions. This is the first silence in heaven. So I just wanted to, to go over the fact that Revelation is really a series of sections and judgments, each ending in judgment in parallel, having reference to the same points in time. Okay, Remember the circus act, things going on simultaneously all around you, but they're really happening at the same time. The book consists of seven, okay, if you can imagine, you remember that number, seven, an important number, seven churches. Okay, there's a series of uh, seven sections running parallel, each ending with Judgment Day. And I would remind you of what the Hebrew writer said in chapter seven, I'm sorry, verse, uh, chapter nine, verse 27. It is appointed unto, unto man to die, but once, and then the judgment. Okay? In these seven sections, the same theme appears in all the sections. There's the bliss of the redeemed, the destruction of Christ's enemies, divine judgment upon men. There's also trials and persecutions of the church. Even the sudden letters to the churches constitute an overture of this series. Kind of repetitive, if you remember how they went through those things. And, um, Recurring, recurring themes, although some different specifics. The same promises are repeated in all sections. The most notable one, or at least my favorite, is, and God shall wipe away all tears. It appears again in, uh, at the end of Revelation in chapter 21, verse 4, one of my uh, anchor verses. That's a really uh, consoling verse. All right, there's a lot here on this slide, so let's see if we can walk you through this. Um, in this section of chapter 8 through 11, there's seven different trumpets. It's a little confusing, because earlier there was seven different seals. Okay? Like you seal an envelope, not the kind that is in the circus, that barks, not that seal. Okay, if you're with me. Okay, but here's, here's a, a diagram of them, uh, and I'm going to share some facts about them. That you can see, I don't know if you can read the, the, the scripture in green at the bottom, but it starts at Re uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, and it goes over through to the far right, Revelation chapter 11, ending in verse 19. Uh, the trumpets announced here are a series of partial judgments. Starting from this side, you know, it says one-third. Well, why isn't it a hundred, why isn't it all of it? Because it's partial, it's partial judgment, okay? It's a series of partial judgments and calamities. <clears throat> the result of each one of those is, and they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or their thefts. It's a recurring theme, okay? So at this point, heaven is ready to move against the enemies of the Lamb and his church. At this point in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, heaven is ready to move against them. If you look at the first four trumpets, they are against the world's environment, the environment in which man finds himself inhabitating. And those judgments are specifically against the environment as opposed to the final three judgments which are directed against wicked people directly. So you see the shift. It, it escalates. I just wanted to note that the calamities, the woes that occur come through evil men as its agent, okay? Actually human beings, which go along with Satan's plan 
and, and execute these things uh, against wicked people. Let's think about Rome for a minute. Um, Rome was loaded with hellish rottenness and internal decadence of the entire empire. Rome's downfall was propagated by a series of corrupt rulers from within the empire. Now you may be beginning to see a parallel here between what's happening in our world 2000, roughly 2,000 years later. So as I said earlier, this was written in a historical context to suffering saints back in 95, about 95 AD. However, it still has application in 2022, doesn't it? Okay. Um, the, the fierce host of corrupt rulers had a king, according to the scriptural text. Abaddon was a name in Hebrew and a polygon in Greek. This is from Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, which I didn't realize until I put that down. 9, 11. That didn't mean anything back then, and I, I don't think there's anything to that now. It's just a coincidence, but uh, it does conjure up more recent memories. Uh, it just happened to be in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11. Both those words, uh, for the name of the king, mean destroyer. Destroyer. He is a wrecker of everything that is fine and holy like in our contemporary culture today. There's various groups, counterculture, woke, there's different words for it. Uh, you know them, you're familiar with the concepts. But that they're going about to destroy everything that was established as something to be held in reverence, something to be respected. They want to tear it down and destroy it. And we're, we're witnessing, we're eyewitnesses of this in our very culture at this very moment in time. The same thing was going on when John wrote this letter 2,000 years ago. And it's been going on in between also. I don't mean to say there's only two points in time. Uh, I'm just saying that what was written was written for their edification, but also for each successive generation. Could gain knowledge, could, could gain encouragement, because persecution isn't something that took a holiday. Okay? Let's see. There's a possibly encrypted reference to the emperor of Rome since uh, Domitian, who was an emperor, claimed to be divine by nature of being an incarnation of Apollo, the Greek sun god. And one of the names given in the text for the, the king of the destroyer was Apollon. Apollo, Apollon, you see, the, you see the similarity. So it could be an encrypted message referring to the emperor's part in being the destroyer, who was a leader of the wicked Roman Empire. Okay? The sounding of the sixth trumpet. You can count them across there. The second one from the, from the left, I guess your left, is that right? The sixth, because it's the seventh, the sixth. So you back up one. It reveals that Rome had already gone too far to be saved. Did I say that? Let me say it again. Rome had gone too far to be, re, to be saved. In other words, in the words of Hosea, Old Testament prophet, chapter 5, in verse 4, he said, Your sin prevents you from returning to your God. People reach a point at which they can no longer return. God wants them to return. But in that downward spiral to depravity, there reaches a point of no return. The Roman Empire as a whole, doesn't mean there couldn't be individuals that would repent, okay? But the Roman Empire as a whole had gone too far. They were past repenting. Okay. Nothing at that point remains but to unleash the final woe 
against the evil empire of Rome. I just wanted to note, a special note about prayers. You know, prayer is one of those things that we all know it's important. We're instructed to do it. Jesus, no less, set the example. He prayed. But I don't know if you, if you feel this way, but when I pray, it's mostly, mostly, almost exclusively a one-way conversation. I'm doing the talking. Okay? And I'm listening. And I'm straining. And I'm waiting. And I'm listening. And I'm straining. And I'm waiting. I'm not getting anything back in writing, okay? Well, except for what's already written. But I'm not getting a direct, audible response to my prayer. Okay? And so, it does make me wonder, did my prayer get past the ceiling? Or did it just hit the ceiling and bounce back? Here's, here's what I think the answer is. Barbara? I think that the Holy Spirit works in us. And uh, how he does it. But I believe that he causes us to think things that are the answer to our prayers. Something happens in our life that the Holy Spirit directs. Thank you for that. Let me, let me stop you there. That's all I can remember at once. Barbara made an excellent point. She said she believes that the Holy Spirit puts certain thoughts in our mind, particularly when we pray, as a response to those prayers. Now, they're not written, okay, but they're put in our mind. And I feel that too, okay? That's a, a direct response to that prayer, and he will work it out for our good based on the fact that we prayed, he listens, he intercedes. Romans chapter 8, the Spirit intercedes for us when we don't even know what to ask or say, Okay? So, absolutely a valid point. Thank, thank you for that. I didn't mean to cut you short, but I have a short memory. The, only so many bites fit in the, the file, and then I've got to get a fresh bite. Okay. <clears throat> so, let me read the verse. I, you've been looking at it. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Does God hear the prayers of the saints on earth? This verse emphatically states, yes. So remember that the next time you're praying and wondering, I haven't seen anything, I, ha I haven't gotten a, at least the response I was asking for in the time frame I was looking for. Okay? I'll give you one more example. Um, Daniel, back in the book of Daniel, uh, he goes to pray. And he fast, he's fasting and he's praying. And finally, after 21 days, how long is that? How many weeks is that? About, uh, after praying about three weeks, he gets a response. He gets a visit from an angel. Okay? An angel from heaven responds and says, uh, I'm here in response to your prayer. Oh, by the way, which we heard when you first started praying it three weeks ago. It was heard. But I was detained by a dark spiritual entity in getting here and arriving. So maybe a little late, but I'm here and you were heard since you began praying. I'm just reminding you. Our prayers are heard even if we don't feel like we've gotten an answer of any sort. We've been heard. And that's important. Our prayers are powerful. Assuming they're in line with God's will and word. Which I'm sure you wouldn't want it any other way. How are we doing here? 19. Okay. We're going to take a look at um, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 5. Can, are you all able to read that uh, in the yellow? Is that large enough to read? Everybody pretty much read that. Anybody can't read it? It's like an eye test. Cover the other eye. Okay, no. All right, we're good. All right, while you're reading that, I, I just wanted to mention that. Let me see where to start. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like that of a scorpion 
when it stings a man. Notice the prohibition against killing. No killing. What is this torment? Let me offer this suggestion to you from my study. I think the torment is the torment of false idea. False idea. What's a false idea? Well, it's an idea that does not have truth in it. it in fact, it contradicts the truth. Okay? It's not a, a physical sting like I got stung by a wasp. This is talking about in your mind, in your thinking. Okay? A false idea. Let me give you an example, an illustration from this. Communism. It's always presented as virtuous and noble. Yes? That's how it's presented. That's how it's sold, if you will. That's what it looks like at the beginning. But in the end, it is always tyranny, oppression, misery, bloodshed, and death. Always. Those deceived don't recognize the false idea until it's too late. The scripture here is going to introduce this idea of um, the bottomless pit. It's going to come up in a minute, but I, I, I want to preview it in our minds. The bottomless pit. And out of the bottomless pit comes locusts. You know what a locust is. You know what a locust does. They're a terrible thing. They would come across Egypt to the land and they eat everything green. That's what they live off of. The problem is that leaves nothing for people to live off of. And it creates famine and starvation and death. Okay? So a plague of locusts was a horrible, horrible plight. Okay? This is not that kind of a locust. But it's nonetheless more destructive. False idea. I put them horizontally because at least in my experience, I've seen that on bumper stickers horizontally. C-O-E-X-I-S-T. Coexist. And each of those letters stands for something which I've listed vertically, which uh, there's some slight variations in what they stand for, but this is sort of the idea. Islam, peace, male, female, Judaism, Wicca, pagan, uh, Taoism, Confucianism, and last, Christianity. The principal sin of the Roman Empire was idolatry, interestingly enough. The, they were worship, worshiping the emperor instead of the creator god. Okay? Idolatry. And with idolatry, immorality, immorality always goes hand in hand. They had given themselves to murders, fornications, sorceries, and thefts, if that might sound familiar. All of these, they say, are ways to God. If that's true, then Jesus died in vain because there were six other viable options. That is a preposterously false idea. Which one of those other six groups sacrificed their own son for that to be a successful, viable plan? Not one. No one. No, no plan ever did. Save one. Okay. Such false idea is void of any rational reasoning. The first six. But rather is a vain attempt to rewrite the terms of the peace treaty, the covenant, peace treaty covenant, with God. When you have a peace treaty, let me explain something. The winner of the battle, the war, always sets the terms of the peace agreement. Never the loser, the one conquered, never sets the terms. That's always the way. There's never any case where that's not what it is. You agree with that? The victor always sets the terms for the peace treaty.
So, who among us has conquered of our own sin and death? Let me say this is not something that you want to try at home. It's not something you want to try on your own. Because let me assure you, you don't have the horsepower to do it. You can't redeem yourself from your sin. You have nothing to offer to cover for your sin. And death, the last enemy, what are you going to do about that? The king of terrors. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Therefore, only Christ is the victor and he is the only one who can set the terms of the treaty or the covenant. Okay? This is my favorite picture. I had to find a, you know, a picture that, that fit, that, that fit yet didn't go where I didn't want to go. And, and it took some scouring, but I, I think this does it. Let, let me read this to you, and then we're going to talk about it. Can you see the picture? Can you see the words? Everybody's just kind of like in a 50-yard stare, like, like you're stunned or you can't see it, I don't know which. You see it? Okay, we see it, all right. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces like faces of men. They had hair like the hair of a woman, and their teeth were like teeth of lions. Let's walk through those. Like horses for battle. Locusts, these are locusts being described. So, what I'm suggesting to you that everything that's written in Revelation, remember, is not literal. It's a, a apocryphal language. Okay? It's exaggerated, it's it's distorted, it's vision, um, so it, it well could be standing for something else. But So what is it? Uh, it says they've got crowns like unto gold, but they're not genuine, but they're false, okay? The wicked ideas always advocate from the premise of virtue, benevolence, equality of outcome, and fairness. Glamorized, idealized, utopias, okay? This is always how they're presented. But false ideas promise all kind of things. But at last, when the mask comes off, the crowns are not really gold at all, but tinsel. Repression, tyranny, death, and destruction are nakedly enthroned above the unhappy peoples who have been deceived. For example, homosexuality was one of the lifestyles uh, derived, uh, derived from sensuality and wickedness which figured prominently in the downfall of Rome. The same gross evil has surfaced again and again in several periods of social decline and overthrow of established order. Their faces, this says they had faces like men. The locusts are not symbols of invisible demons, but of very evil, visible, and destructive men advocating their delusions of hell itself. The hair, hair as a woman, meaning men letting their hair grow long will mark certain locusts who plague the earth. Example, Fidel Castro and his host of revolutionaries who appeared with long dirty hair and raped and pillaged the country of Cuba. Uh oh. Alright, let's go on here. There we go. Denial's downward departure, spiral to depravity. This is from Romans 1 and 18, which you're familiar with. If you've ever been one of Ken Stiegel's class, I know you've seen and, and studied this verse. You can look at it on the left and a little summation on the right while I share some other thoughts with you. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. These people who are in this downward spiral that it described both in Revelation and in Romans 
are, have been captured, their minds have been captured by Satan to do his will. And he did it with false idea. False idea. Uh, recently, newsworthy, a Berkeley professor promoting false idea testified before Congress. When accused of the congressman of endangering people, I'm sorry, when questioned, when questioned, her retort was to immediately accuse the congressman of, en you're endangering people by asking me that question. Which is another way of saying, we don't want our false ideas examined by light. Therefore, you, Mr. Congressman, have to close your mouth and sit down. You're not allowed to challenge our false ideas. They, people who are in the dark do not want their deeds exposed by the light. Okay? They abhor that. So they'll do anything to shut the light out, to shut that off. Meanwhile, those propagating false ideas are busy recruiting rebellion by demanding denial of reality and truth. You know what the, you know what the reality was that they were, per, they were trying to switch everything around and say men were biologically capable of having children. Utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. And yet they promote that and they demand that their students go along with this. They're perverting the young minds, I guess that people are foolish enough to pay money to have people do that to their children. I, I can't imagine, but it's going on. Refusal to allow examination of false ideas by attempting to silence any examination with light. Therefore they can remain under the cover of darkness. Okay, the result of the locust false ideas. Now this comes from Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter in verse 15. But outside, that's outside the new Jerusalem, outside of heaven, outside the, the abode of the redeemed. We have those outside of the dogs, the saucers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. False idea, dot, dot, dot. Practicing lies. False ideas from locusts from the bottomless pit. Their strategy is threefold. To deny, discredit, and distort. And the end is death. For Satan himself, Jesus said, Satan himself has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Always ending in death. Chapter 10, the little book. Uh, some texts like NIV will say the little scroll. Don't be thrown off by that book scroll. Okay, it's the same, it's referring to the same thing. <clears throat> the only little book in all of history to remain open in spite of the devil and, the, and all that hell has tried to do to shut the little book. The little book, my friends, is the New Testament. The New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which the King James Version actually says that on the cover page. It says the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 26. The Jews had gone to Pilate and said, listen, we demand that you allow us or, or have a guard posted at the tomb for we're afraid that these Christian folks are going to come and steal the body and then deceive everybody into saying, well, you know, he rose. And then the second calamity will be worse than the first. And Caesar's response is, go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. And they did. They sealed it and posted Roman centurions who were authorized to kill, to protect that seal. Okay? In spite of that, the tomb was opened, wasn't it? Okay. So, the devil and all his cohorts have tried to seal this up since, since the New Testament is talking about. 
unsuccessfully. In the meantime, history is a record. The first five books of the New Testament contain the fulfilled promises of the Lord. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which we have now, have, have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look into. That is from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. This little scroll or little book is a New Testament. It also contains the judgment of God against the people who had rejected him. See 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 through 9. It says he's going to send back angels in flaming fire to deal out retribution on those who know not and obey not the gospel. Where's the gospel found? The New Testament in this little scroll or a little book right here. Huh. I'm not sure. There it is. Oh, okay, this is how it works. This is one of those where they float in. I forgot. I forgot I did that. Revelation chapter 11. Uh, it talks about several things. It talks about a measuring rod, uh, measuring the temple, 42 months, two witnesses, slaying of the witnesses, resurrection of the witnesses. So we're going to go over, just briefly, just, just real quickly summarize what, what they're talking about. In Revelation 11, the reed, the measuring rod, is the word of God. That is the standard by which things are judged, is it not? What did Jesus said? By my words shall you be judged. By your words too. Okay. The measuring, that's the sealing of the saints. The temple and the altar. This is the church of God. Okay? The body of those universally who have obeyed and follow Christ. <clears throat> Incidentally, those outside the court, not in the temple, but on the outside court, are the Gentiles, those who have rejected Christ. So we have a dichotomy there. The 42 months, this, this is talking about this whole period of dispensation. The two witnesses. The two witnesses are the Word of God and the Word indwelled church. That's you and me. The word indwelled church. We have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the word, right? In the meaning was the word. And the word became flesh from John chapter 1. Uh, let's go with this. Did I miss one? Uh, the beast out of the abyss. Satan. Satan. The slaying of the witnesses. Did I get that one yet? There we go. The slaying of the witnesses. This is nothing other than the, word, the world's rejection of their testimony. Of the word of God and the indwelling of the word in the church. Okay, Those who reject it. This is the slaying of the witnesses. And the resurrection of the witnesses is the resurgence of of truth. Yeah, nice. Okay, this, this, we saw something like this last week. Um, whose identification do you bear? Uh, it's either one or the other. There isn't any neutral. It's a binary, one or a zero. The sealed. Only this, this is the only seal that saves from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Also, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Being sealed by the Lord. The Lord knoweth then they that are his. 2 Timothy 2.19 Satan also has a mark. The mark of the beast. That's in Revelation uh, chapter 13 and 14. 
Ezra, back in the ninth chapter, talk, talked about an X on the, on the foreheads of those who were innocent and grieved over the abominations of courting in the city. They were marked, marked by God. Okay? Five minutes. The sealed. Uh, uh, the Great Tribulation is merely another name for the whole Christian life in any, in any and all ages of the church. So you are in a tribulation as well. We all are. Through, Jesus said, through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. So whose, say, whose identification do you bear? Application. Trumpets. Trumpets will surely sign, sound. Rather. Let me share with you this, this poem. I think it fits this. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift my soul to answer him, be jubilant my feet. To me, this demands action, a repentance response. And in part, that's what a series of these trumpets are about. They're calling men, people, to repentance. That's why it wasn't an absolute destruction at the first trumpet, but a series of them to give an opportunity for the wicked to turn, to change their mind, change direction, repent. Remember back from Revelation chapter 3, Jesus stands before the door of the church at Laodicea. Remember what he said about the, his description of them? He said, you, you are either hot nor cold. As it is, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Wow. That's not sanitary. And yet later he says, Behold, I stand at your door and knock. Which a literal interpretation is, Behold, I have taken my stand and knock continually. That you would invite me in and we would sup together, dine together, break a meal, break bread. And he's saying this to people who had forsaken their, the love of Christ and had become involved in gross immorality with the paganism around them, the culture around them. They had given in to that. And yet he still stood at their door, resolutely, knocking continually. Folks, as long as it's still day, he still stands at the door and knocks. Two millennia later, he's still standing at the door and knocking until day breaks. Uh, the second one, truth. Truth is in God's Word. The Bible is the, be is the beginning. It said it, in the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh. Who's that? It's Jesus. Okay? The, he, Jesus also went on to say in John chapter 8, the truth shall make you free. You know what you're free from? You're free from the bondage of things. You're free from false idea. False idea will exterminate you. Okay? But you have the antidote for it. You have the truth. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth. The truth. He is the embodiment of truth and the life from John chapter 14. And the third, the third point is transformation. Those who swallow false idea are as amazing as they are tragic. They have elected for themselves destruction rather than salvation. They change the covenant of the Creator for their own convenience. But it didn't really change the covenant, did it? <laughs> Only how they viewed it, which was a false idea. 
So stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm in the truth, and you shall be secure, even through tribulation. Right on note. Thank you. We'll see you next week.